massive all nuclear technology. We've heard a bit about um, what's happening in the military world. So this presentation is about civil nuclear technology and how we spread that to countries that need to use it without allowing them to then misuse it for, for weapons um, uh, if, if they're part of the, the treaty, which, which stops them from, from proliferating. So going to the non-proliferation treaty, my picture hasn't come up. There's a map on here. <laughs> so as we heard this morning, there's, um, there's five nuclear weapon states. There's states which are signed into the treaty, China, Russia, USA, France, and the UK. They are all allowed to ha have nuclear weapons and to keep them. The, the states which have not signed up to the treaty, which is most of the rest of the world, it has near universal membership, um, have all agreed not to seek to take nuclear weapons. Um, and the bargaining chip was that nuclear technology would have been transferred from the nuclear weapon states to the non-weapon states for peaceful purposes. Now, when this was written, um, there wasn't so much um, technological advancement in reactor design. There wasn't that much use of nuclear energy. So now we've seen the world change and develop. We've seen that technology be, be sort of be spread from the, those that know how to do it um, to those states that don't have that technology, and we've seen it being misused. So that's that's what we're going to cover te in this presentation. Um, so from 1968 through to 2010, um, there was a United Nations review of how the treaty was going. Now. Um, the states which had not signed into the treaty, India, Pakistan, um, Israel, um, are now all nuclear weapons states in that they, they have nuclear technology. Um, North Korea has also done weapons testing. So in that time, um, the technology has been proliferated. So nuclear weapons technology has spread from those that are signed into the treaty to those that haven't signed into the treaty. Um, and also some of the states that signed up to the treaty and agreed not to proliferate the use of nuclear weapons have been found um, to, be, to be using technology that could be used for weapons. For example, Iran um, has recently had sanctions placed on it for, for enriching uranium beyond the levels needed for a nuclear program. Oh, not coming up. Um, okay, so nuclear fuel types. Um, I was looking into uh, the types of fuel cycle to see if I could sort of present a, a proliferation proof way of spreading nuclear technology. If there was a type of reactor we could take out to the world and say, this is fine to use, there's no risk to this being misused or any of the fuel being used for weapons. Um, and there isn't one. So the main types of fuel for a reactor are mined uranium, which has been heavily used by Canada. Canada's um, a big exporter of uranium, um, and they've designed their reactors to, to use pure uranium out of the ground. Um, we've actually done the same thing with, uh, with Magnox reactors. So the old British Magnox reactors used natural uranium. Um, and we actually developed that technology to produce weapons-grade plutonium. So there's a fuel cycle there that in one sense can be used to produce energy and in another sense can be used to produce weapons material. So mined uranium is a risk in itself. Low enriched uranium, um, well, if we're enriching uranium to the levels needed for a nuclear reactor, about 3 or 4%, then um, the same technology can be used to, to further enrich, to enrich to 20%, up to 80% or 90% um, that it's needed to, for weapons-grade material. And that's what we've seen in Iran. So Iran have got their own enrichment capability, um, and they were enriching up to about the 20% level, which was considered to be um, a proliferation risk, that it wouldn't take much more effort to go from there um, up to the weapons-grade. Um, next, we have mixed oxide fuel. Um, now, that's an interesting one. That's, um, that's a mixture of uranium oxides and plutonium. So it can be used through spent fuel, so fuel rods that have been through a reactor, um, that have been through um, a uranium fuel cycle, and that have um, isotopes of plutonium in. Uh, that can be recycled and put around a reactor again. Um, and to do that, it needs to be reprocessed. So the reprocessing facility the facility that, that would take the, the isotopes of plutonium out of the uranium, that can also be used um, to, to isolate the plutonium and use that for weapons. So mixed oxide fuel is also a risk. Um, and then we have mined thorium. Now thorium is an interesting one because we haven't done much research on thorium in the West. 
So all of our weapons programs um, in the USA and UK have mostly been focused on uranium because that's been something that is you know, in great abundance. Um, but thorium can be used to produce uranium-233, um, an isotope of uranium that is highly fissile and can be used for bomb making. Um, so it's something that we haven't used for weapons, but it can be used for weapons. Um, and it's also something that India has huge natural reserves of. So India being outside of the non-proliferation treaty and also having their own research programs on thorium, um, it is it's a high risk that that could be used and it could be proliferated around the world outside of the treaty. So, talking about the nuclear fuel cycle, sorry about these pictures. Um, there's, there's three parts of the fuel cycle that are a risk, basically. So, there's the enrichment phase, so enriching uranium to then go into a reactor. Um, the risk is that, that uranium is enriched past the levels needed for, for civil nuclear and on to weapons grade. Um, there's the reactor itself, so the reactor itself can be used to convert one fuel type into another fuel type, so it can be used to, um, to, to, to create plutonium from uranium, it can be used to create uranium-233 um, from thorium, so the reactor itself is a risk, and also reprocessing, so once the fuel has come out, there is a risk that um, the isotopes are taken out of that fuel and used for weapons. So. Um, this is just a diagram that shows um, how uranium um, is enriched, so how uranium-235 is separated from U-238. So U-238 um, is mined uranium taken out of the ground. Um, it has a small amount of uranium-235 in it. Um, so it's all created into a gas, and that gas is swirled around into a centrifuge. Um, and the, the heavier U-238 sort of preferentially goes towards the outside, U-235 goes towards the middle, um, and that's sort of extracted and, and then enriched by separating out. Um, and once you've got the technology to, to enrich to a certain level, um, you can just carry on, keep separating it, keep separating it until you get a really high 90% U-235 for weapons grade. Um, so going back to the, the thorium fuel cycle, this is the biggest reactor proliferation risk. So India's done a lot of research into thorium reactors for nuclear energy, which is good because they need you know, a natural source of energy, lower dependence on oil. Um, but using these thorium reactors, thorium is very easily converted into uranium-233, which can be used for weapons. So that's something that's very much outside of the non-proliferation treaty and outside of international controls. So if India decides to sell this technology around the world, um, it's possible that thorium could be used um, for, for weapons when you know, we're using the, the treaty to control the spread of uranium. Uh, never mind. Um, okay, reprocessed plutonium um, is probably the lowest risk. Um, because plutonium, uh, to, to get sort of weapons grade plutonium, um, it needs to be on a very, very short fuel cycle. So the uranium fuel rods need to go in, be burnt up really quickly, and then taken out. Um, if they're left in the reactor too long, you get too many different isotopes, and it's, it makes it difficult to, um, to have a really sort of pure substance to make a weapon out of. So reprocessing facilities are probably the, the lowest proliferation risk, but it's still something that could possibly be used um, to produce um, weapons grade plutonium. So the solution to all this that's been proposed by the International Atomic Energy Agency is that we actually bring these facilities under international control. So if we have international fuel banks where we have um, an internationally owned enrichment centre, countries can go um, and know that they will have a, a secure supply of fuel, that if they, if they run their own nuclear programmes, they will be able to go um, and get, <laughs> get enrichment uh, facilities, then they won't need to create their own technologies. So if we really want to curb the spread of this, the enrichment and the reprocessing side, um, if we provide um, an internationally available source of that, then it, it will deter countries from following their own programmes. And those that choose to, um, to continue down their own development and not to use um, very cost-effective internationally owned facilities, they will sort of draw attention to themselves. If there's an easy way of getting this fuel and they decide not to do that and to follow their own um, development programmes, then that's going to shine a light on them for the international community to, to ask you know, the question, why? Why is this necessary when the fuel is readily available? 
So, the future of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, I think we've done as much as we can policy-wise. Um, the policy has got us so far, and now it's down to international collaboration to actually pr provide the economic argument um, of putting everything under international control so that everyone has access to the fuel when they need it, um, but without actually um, allowing that technology to proliferate around. Thank you.